Hello everyone, how's it going? My name is Dan the Tutor. Today we are going to be talking about a Physics 1 topic. It is rotational static equilibrium, which is a really long series of words, but let me just tell you what we're talking about. Rotational means we're talking about torques, because these are forces that cause things to rotate. Static means not moving, so that's also going to include not rotating. And then equilibrium, meaning that all the forces and all the torques are going to balance each other out. So you don't need to remember the word rotational static equilibrium, but if you're looking for more problems out there online or on YouTube, this is the topic you're going to search to find the problems you're looking for. Rotational static equilibrium. And these are problems like this. For instance, we have a balance beam and you have a fulcrum in the middle, and it's kind of like a teeter-totter shape right here. Now basically what we're talking about is you put one mass over here, let's say that mass is two kilograms, and then I want to put a three kilogram mass somewhere on this side, but I want to know how far away from the fulcrum I should put it. Now I can tell you that this distance right here from the two kilograms to the fulcrum, I can say that distance is like 50 centimeters, and I can say the entire bar is 100 centimeters long, and what I'm solving for here is the x. It's the distance that the 3 kilograms is away from the 2 kilograms. So if you want to solve any of these problems for rotational static equilibrium, the first step, always the same, FBD, free body diagram. So I only have two forces here that I care about. It's the force of gravity, mg, from the 2 kilogram block, and there's also the force of gravity, mg, from the 3 kilogram block. If you don't want them to have the same name, then you can call the first one m2g, because it's the 2 kilogram block, and you can call the other one m3g, because it's the 3 kilogram block. I don't really care, but the important thing is that you consider both of these forces. Now technically, just so you know, technically, there are some normal forces going up here, and another normal force going up right there. Now the reason why I am actually not going to draw these forces on my free body diagram is because I only want the forces acting on my bar. In other words, those normal forces, those are acting on the block. I do not care about that for rotational static equilibrium. I only care about the thing they're balancing on, which is the bar in the middle. So these are the only two forces I care about. And now we are ready for step two. Step two is the torques canceling out equation. In other words, torques going clockwise equals the torques going counterclockwise. This is the equilibrium part. And if you think about it, let me try and clean up this picture a little bit. If you think about it, this two kilogram block right here wants to make the bar rotate that way. It wants to make the thing spin in that direction. That direction is counterclockwise. I had to literally look at a clock for a second to remember that. And then the other three kilogram block, well that wants to make the bar move that way, and that is the opposite. It's the clockwise direction. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set these two torques equal to each other. Remember the definition for torque. A torque is equal to a force times a distance times the sine theta. And I'll explain what that sine theta is in a second. Most of the time it doesn't even matter. It usually only matters when I give you an angle, but I'll explain what theta is anyway. So first, let's do torques going clockwise. That's going to be the right one, the three kilogram. So the force is the force of gravity, which is m3g. I'll plug in in the next step. The distance is going to be x, because that's the distance from the fulcrum, the pivot point. So I write x here for the distance. And then for sine theta, here's what I'm going to tell you. Theta is always the angle between your force and your distance. Which way does the force point? That way. Which way does the distance point? That way. What's that angle between the two green lines? The angle is 90 degrees, and the sine of 90 is going to be 1, which is why I don't even have to include anything on the sine theta part, because anything times 1 is itself. And yes, that's going to happen most of the time. Most of the time it's sine of 90, so you don't even have to worry about it. So that's the torques going clockwise. Torques going counterclockwise is going to be very similar. The force this time is m2g. It's the force of gravity on the two kilogram block. 
the distance is different. The distance is 50 centimeters. Now, real quick, do we have to convert that to meters? Because we always have to convert to meters in physics, right? Well, technically it's always a good habit, but you can actually get away with this problem without needing to convert. And the reason why is because as long as you deal with centimeters only in this problem, all the other units end up canceling out and you can keep centimeters only for this problem though, only for these kinds of problems. So now that I have my clockwise and my counterclockwise, I can set them equal to each other. M3GX equals M2G times 50. You can say the G's cancel out. M3 was three, X is what I'm solving for. M2 is two and 50 is still 50. So then three X equals 100, just divide by three. We'll get X equals 33.3 and the units now are centimeters. So in other words, where would I put that block? I'll draw it again down here. So basically if this distance is 50 centimeters for the two kilogram block, then that means the three kilogram block is gonna be a little bit closer it's going to be more towards the center. And that makes sense because there's a trade-off here. I'm not sure if you understand that. But there's a trade-off between force and distance. Basically, since this one weighs heavier, you need to put it closer to the center in order for it to balance out with the torque from the 2 kilogram mass. And that's all you have to do for this one. So let's try another one now. Let's say for the second one, I have this scenario going on. Again, I have the pivot point. This time, my block, my log, whatever you want to call it, the balance beam, is going to be thicker. In other words, I'm going to give it a mass. Let's say its mass is 100 kilograms. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a 20 kilogram block on this side right here to try and balance it out. Now, I'm just going to tell you this is not going to be enough to balance it out. In other words, the bar is still going to tip over that way. But luckily, I have something else going on here. I'm attaching a rope at the other end, which has a tension T, which is ultimately what I'm going to be solving for. I want to solve for the tension T to keep this thing upright and not moving. And now to give some distances, let's say the distance from the block to the middle is 2 meters, and that's at the end. And then the entire bar, let's say, is 10 meters long. Okay, so now how do I solve for T? Well, the first thing is always first, free body diagram. So the force is acting on my bar. This time I've got gravity, mg, going down there. I'll call it little mg. I've got tension pointing up right here. So that's good. We're solving for it. And then there's one more force that I care about. It is the force of gravity on the bar itself. Now, one thing you need to know about all these problems, if you have a bar like this and we need to consider the force of gravity on the bar, we need to talk about the center of mass. Not the confusing calculation for center of mass. I'm just saying that the bar center of mass, C-O-M, center of mass, is always in the middle. And that is where you're going to draw your force of gravity. I'm gonna call it big MG for the bar itself. And where is the location of that center of mass? Well, if the bar is 10 meters long, you literally just divide that distance by two. The center of mass is five meters from the end, just like that. Now you'll notice for the last problem, we did not include this force for two reasons. Number one, the bar didn't have any mass itself, so it didn't matter. And number two, even if you were to consider the mass in the center, like right here, well, what's the distance of that force? Well, even though the force we'll say is mg, the distance is zero from the pivot point where that fulcrum is. So in other words, even if you wanted to calculate the torque, the torque would have been mg times the distance, which is zero. The torque is zero anyway. That's why you only have to worry about this extra force from the log is if you move your pivot point, if you move your fulcrum off of center. And that's also going to play a role in the next problem too, just so you know. But now we need to talk about the torques going clockwise and the torques going counterclockwise. So this is already really cluttered. So I'm gonna draw a second picture just to help me understand this. So first, the torque from the 20 kilogram mass, that's going to make the bar want to turn this way. And it wants to make the bar turn that way because the block is there. And that is a counterclockwise direction. 
The next torque I will consider is the tension. If you notice the direction of that tension, that wants to make the bar spin this way as well. So another counterclockwise, even though they look like opposites, that's still the same counterclockwise direction. And then the only force that's causing the thing to move clockwise is from the bar itself. That makes the bar want to spin this way. That direction is clockwise. So even if you don't understand exactly what I'm talking about with the clockwise versus the counterclockwise, a lot of my students actually have trouble with this. Just don't worry about it. If you can at least tell me that the block here and the bar here are going in opposite directions in terms of the torque, and if you can recognize that this rope here is on the same team as the 20 kilogram block, and when I say the same team, I mean both of those, the 20 kilogram block and the tension are trying to stop this bar from falling. So if you at least understand that, then we can, you know, set up the equation. So the torque going counterclockwise this time, I'm going to have two torques. That just means I have to add them together. It's no big deal. Let me erase some of these lines. So remember, the torque is equal to a force times a distance. The force is mg, which is the 20 kilograms. I'll plug that in in a second. Times the distance. If you remember, this distance is 2 meters. So that's times 2. And then sine theta. Since I didn't give an angle, just don't even worry about it. It is going to be sine of 90, which is 1, in case you're curious. So we're good there. And then I'm going to add the torque from the tension force. Now the tension force has a tension t, so the force is t, times the distance. Well, I don't know this distance yet, actually. It's the distance from here to there, the pivot point to my force. Now, since we know the whole thing is 10 meters long, then I know that that distance must be 8 meters. You know, that just makes logical sense. 2 plus 8 equals 10. So that's my distance, 8. And once again, since there's no angle here, the tension will be 90 degrees with the distance. So sine of 90 is 1, so I don't need it. So that's it for counterclockwise. And notice I just added the torques together, no big deal. Now for clockwise, again, I'm going to erase some of these lines to help me out here. So I want the torque coming from big mg from the bar itself. So obviously the force is going to be big mg, that's the force. The distance is this little distance right there, which again, I don't know yet. But remember that since the whole thing's 10 meters long. That means that distance is 5 meters. And since 2 plus whatever this distance is must equal the total 5, that distance from the pivot point to my center of gravity must be 3 meters to add up to 5. So hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, just rewatch this explanation. But that's going to be my distance that goes right here. It's just 3. And then once again, the sine of theta, still 90 degrees, still going to be 1. It doesn't matter. And now I just need to set these two equal to each other. mg times 2 plus t times 8 equals big mg times 3. This time gravity does not cancel out because it doesn't show up in this term in the middle, the t times 8. So I'm just going to plug in my numbers and try and solve. Mass is 20, g is 9.8 times 2, plus 8t equals big M is 100 times g is 9.8 times 3. And now I just need a calculator to plug in some of these numbers here. So on the left side, we're going to have 392 plus 8t equals, on the other side, we have 2,940. Now to solve for t, which is what I want, I just subtract 392 from each side, and that's going to give me 8t equals... 2,548, and then I just divide both sides by 8. I wonder if this will be a round number. Well, it's almost, actually. The tension is going to be 318.5, and the units for tension are newtons. And there we go. There's my answer for that one. If you do have any questions on any of the problems I do today, please post them in the comments below. I'd be happy to respond. And now for the last problem, it is going to be the hardest. I have a drawbridge, okay? So here's the drawbridge right here connected to the castle wall like this. And I have, again, a tension force right here that's going to point that way. Let's say that angle is 60 degrees with the bridge itself. 
Once again, I would like to find the tension. But to make this extra challenging, across the drawbridge is, let's say, a car, because of course they did have cars back in medieval times. And let's say that car has a mass of 1,500 kilograms. Now the bridge itself only has a mass of 700 kilograms, but don't worry, it's still strong enough to hold the car on top of it, and we want to solve for the tension that allows it to stay up. Now two more pieces of information. Let's say the entire bridge is 12 meters long, and this distance from the car to the edge of the bridge is, let's say, three meters. So now how do I solve this one? So first, I always draw my free by diagram. This time, once again, I have three forces. It's the force of gravity from the car, which I will call big MG this time, because it's the bigger mass. I've obviously got a tension right here, and that tension is what I'm solving for, and it points that way. And then finally, I have the force of gravity from the bridge itself, which, as always, that's going to be in the center of mass, which is right about here at the six meter mark, if you think about it, because the whole thing's 12 meters long. And that's going to point down, I'm gonna call it little mg. You could also call it mg bridge or mg car. That's fine too, it doesn't matter, as long as you're notating it somehow. So that's it for the free body diagram. That's all the forces. And now I need to say, well, the torque clockwise must equal the torque going counterclockwise. So this time, hopefully you see this. If this is my pivot point or my fulcrum, it's the point of the bridge, hopefully you can see that the car is going to produce a torque going that way. It wants to rotate that way, which is clockwise. Same for the bridge, it's pointing in the same direction, also clockwise. And then the tension in the rope, that's going to try and keep the bridge spinning the other way. It's gonna try and keep it that way which is counterclockwise. So there's my three torques now, and now I just have to plug them into the equation. So the first torque for clockwise, again, there's two, so I have to add them together. Force times distance times sine theta. The force is mg for the car, which I'm just gonna plug it in now, because I don't care. 1500 times 9.8 times the distance. Well, remember, it's the distance to the fulcrum, so that is a distance of three meters right there, so times three. And so that's it for the car. And then plus the torque from the bridge itself, which is little mg. Now that mass is 700 times g, which is 9.8 times that distance. And that distance is going to be the distance from the middle to the bar. Hopefully you see that it's six meters because it's the 12 meters total cut in half because of center of mass. So times six for the distance. And then for both of these, the sine theta doesn't matter because everything's already at 90 degrees, like it always is for these problems. And again, that's for the bridge. Okay, two thirds of the way down. Unfortunately, the hardest one is going to be the last one. It is from the tension in the rope. And that's because we do have this angle that we have to worry about. Now, obviously the force is going to be my tension because that's the force, tension. The distance, think about it, the distance from your point here to the other end of the bridge here is the full 12 meters this time. So the distance is 12. And now for sine theta, I have a proposition for you. Before you go ahead and say sine 60 because that's the angle I give you, maybe you remember the game show Deal or No Deal. And at the end of the show, when it comes down to two cases, if you didn't take the money yet, Howie Mandel will always give you the option of switching your case, for better or for worse. Now, I'm going to give you the opportunity to switch your case. So before you say sine 60, I'm also going to throw out here this other angle right here, which is obviously going to be 30, because you have to add up to 90. And I'll tell you, the correct answer is either sine 60 or sine 30. And I want you to tell me if you'd like to keep your case, the 60 degrees, or switch your case, the 30 degrees. I'll give you a second to think about it. Okay, time's up. Now let me just clear some space so I can explain this well. So remember, that theta in the sine theta equation is always the angle between your force, which points that way, and your distance to the fulcrum, which points that way. 
And because the green is clearly the 60, it is going to be the sine of 60. And that's what I'm going to put right here in my equation. Keep in mind, it's not always the angle I give you. In other words, I gave a 60 to this time. I could have just as easily told us the angle was 30. I could have given you this angle. And all of a sudden, now it'd have to be, you know, 90 minus 30 to find the right angle. So always remember that theta in the sine theta equation is always the angle between your force and your distance to the fulcrum. And then you'll never mess up. And so now I can start plugging this in. 1500 times 9.8 times 3 plus 700 times 9.8 times 6 is equal to t times 12 times sine 60. And now I just needed a calculator and plug in these numbers. I'm just going to do the entire left side in one step because that's not too hard. And the entire left side comes out to 85,260. On the right, 12 times sine 60. Make sure your calculator is in degrees. And I'll get 10.39 times t. And then just divide both sides by 10.39. And we'll get a final answer for the tension of 8,204 newtons. And there we go. That was some fun problems today. And again, what topic was this called? It was called rotational static equilibrium, which means torques not moving or rotating, and they balance each other out. So thank you all for watching today's video. I hope to see you in the next one. Have a great rest of your day, and bye-bye.